Imagine a world where robots are part of our everyday life, and not only as helpers, but as companions and friends. And furthermore, imagine a world where we can all take part in giant intelligent entities made up of potentially thousands of humans and machines, even if with a few seconds of our time every day. Entities whose capabilities might well far surpass the current limits of both human as well as artificial intelligence. This has been my dreams and my goals in the last years. And they have indeed produced some fruit. In the words of the BBC regarding my lab, the Interactive Robots and Media Lab. His name is Ibn Sina, named after the ancient philosopher renowned for his early scientific discoveries. But unlike his older counterpart, this Ibn Sina is altogether more high-tech. As well as being fluent in English and Arabic, he can hold a conversation with humans. He looks for information about us on the internet and uses that to chat with us. He'll also remember it for the next time you meet. But this lab isn't in Japan, China or the United States. It's in Alain, just an hour's drive from the UAE capital, Abu Dhabi. But however intriguing as this future world might be, full of robots, a very important question follows. How can we try to make sure that the building is closer to a world of harmony, progress and peace, and not to a horrific dystopia full of suffering and destruction? This is the overarching question that I want to ask in my talk. And in order to explore this question, I would like to ask you to embark with me upon a journey that will consist of four stages. First, I will start by talking about the beauty of nature, and passing through the nature of beauty, I will arrive at the beauty of relations. Then I will talk about human-human relations and arrive at human-machine relations. And then we will change our topic of inquiry from the nature of the beautiful to enter the nature of the good, and thus discuss ethics. And finally, we will talk about robo-ethics and ask, can a machine decide on its own what is good and what is bad, and act and even kill accordingly? Are you ready? Yes. Let us start. The beauty of nature, manifested in all scales between the microcosm and the macrocosm, has always reflected upon us through a deeply rooted sensation of happiness, amazement, and peace. Proceeding, though, from the beauty of nature to the nature of beauty has always been a fascinating topic of inquiry. And for the ancient Greeks, who were lovers of art and humanity, beauty has often been equated to harmony, and harmony to proportion. But arithmetical proportion is just one form of relation between entities. And for the Greeks, harmony had a much wider sense. One could even define it as the perfect reflection of the relation of the parts to one another in the relation of the parts to the whole. And thus, one moves from the beauty of isolated entities to the beauty of relations, and from relations of abstract proportions to relations of living beings. And who would ever be left untouched by the warm reflection of the love of the last rays of the fall of humanity embracing the first rays of the spring. But our world nowadays is not only full of living beings, we have machines everywhere. And recently, we also have a lot of intelligent machines around us. But how much has our life changed since the introduction of intelligent machines? Just think to yourselves. In the last week, how much time have you spent in direct interaction, one-to-one, -one, with other people? Versus how much time have you spent in mediated interaction through your cell phone, through a chat server, with other humans? Versus how much time have you spent interacting with machines and not humans? The average American is spending more than two hours of his day online, and a big part of this time has to do with interaction with machines and not humans. As we're spending more and more time with machines, and as a consequence of that, we're forming relations with them. Where is the red one? Most of my work had to do with human-robot well, interaction. Machines that could actually learn the meaning of words through examples, or form relations with humans by creating shared memories and shared friends. Or even androids, they could have 
facial expressions. They could come into verbal conversation with humans here in Arabic. And even show as well as recognize emotions. Here you can see sadness. Disbelief. <laughs> and finally, excitement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all the robots that we will be interacting with in the future might well be powered not by onboard processing power, <laughs> but by massive distributed intelligence that will be human and machine at the same time that might be actually be given to them through the cloud, as I have talked about in my previous talks. But the big question here is the following. Okay, some of these robots might indeed be friends and companions, and this is what we talked about before, and this is what we want to have. But how about robots that will become armed guardians or lethal enemies? How can we try to safeguard beauty and make sure that we don't enter a dystopian nightmare through the introduction of these machines? This is exactly where ethics enters the picture. And not just the normative, sterilized textbook ethics that you read about everywhere, what should be, but the actual real-world ethics, which is much more complex, what really is. And thus, we're moving from an inquiry of the nature of the beautiful into an inquiry of the nature of the good. But what is good and what isn't? Well, depending on which philosophical or theological viewpoint one takes, there's many possible answers. Of course, philosophy stems from logic and sensory experience, while theology, in most cases, from revelation and mystical experience. But again, still, what is good and what isn't? Socrates would tell you that knowledge is good, and especially self-knowledge. Aristotle would disagree, saying that self-actualization, turning every potentiality into actuality, is what we should be going for. And the Stoics, who had a different opinion with apathy, the Epicureans would talk about sustainable pleasure. And if we went over to ancient China, we would see the good moving away from the individual and entering the whole state, and thus the first conceptions of the common good being phrased. Then we could go back to the Middle East and have a look at the Abrahamic faiths, equating the good with following divine law, or with love, as it arguably is in Christianity, or submission to divine will. Or we could even get modern scientific theories, such as the ones that David talked about, who might equate the good in the end with evolutionary fitness. And if we go out on the street and ask people, they will tell you things such as, well, the good is money, the good is fame, the good is power. But however varied all these conceptions of the good might be, they are not unrelated with one another. And furthermore, nowadays, each one of us is free to choose whatever he wants or create his own conception or create an eclectic mix of all of the above. And no matter how much variance we have in the good, it's a good thing that we have a lot of agreement on what isn't good. Death, suffering, pain, slavery, cutting off knowledge from people are things that we all agree shouldn't be there. And this is why we were able to create foundational documents such as the Declaration of Human Rights, or the Geneva Convention regarding warfare, or even the first machine ethics declarations that have started to appear. But even if one decides what is good and what isn't, there is still a lot of space for adjusting priorities and parameters in his system. Just think to yourself that you had the following dilemma. If you had to choose between the certain death of a child and the probable death of two adults, what would you choose and why? And thus we're entering our first question of roboethics. Can a machine decide on its own what is good and what isn't and act or even kill accordingly? Well, killer robots are not anymore something that's just there in sci-fi. They're starting to get deployed in the battlefield. And soon we might also have human-robot hybrids with prosthetics, not really like Robocop, but getting closer to him, out there too. So what can we do? I mean, what are the conditions for granting to such a machine the license to kill? Well, there's at least three kinds of conditions. First of all, it should be able to make a correct decision before the action. Then it should be able to shoot accurately 
and get implicated accurately during the action. And in the end, we should be able to assign responsibility after the action. Most people think that correct decision making is just a matter of logic, but if you think about it, this is a very big fallacy. Behind every decision, there's three things. There is an implied or clear ethical system dictating what is right and what is wrong, what is correct and what isn't. There is information pertaining to the decision you're taking, and there is reasoning that has to be fast enough and deep enough. But who is better, humans or machines, when it comes to these three conditions? Well, ethical systems for machines arguably are there since the introduction of the famous three laws of robotics by Asimov more than half a century ago. However, they have proved to be quite difficult to, to implement in this form. But nowadays, there's recent research in machine ethics that enables us to really get AI programs that are able to create moral judgments and ethical decisions, at least beginning to do so. When it comes to information, what one really needs is situational awareness through video cameras and sensors, and also access to databases when he's in action. And there, humans have a disadvantage, which comes from the fact that they need an interface and there is a bottleneck in the interface. And finally, when it comes to reasoning, although it might not be exactly true that human emotions always interfere with correct reasoning, the horizon of possible extensions of speed and depth in the reasoning of machines is much bigger. Thus, in conclusion, it seems that at least where we are right now, we cannot decide, but in the future, machines will have the upper hand when it comes to correct decision making. And they already have it when it comes to accurate shooting, where they have much superior sensory motor capabilities and reflex times. But things are not so clear when it comes to responsibility assignment. I mean, just think to yourself. Imagine that you have an accident where a robot kills somebody he shouldn't. Who is there to blame? Can you blame the robot? Can you blame the manufacturer? Can you blame the owner, the programmer, the engineer, the trainer of the robot? Our legal systems cannot really give you an answer. Well, according to Anglo-Saxon civil law, if you think of the robot as an artifact or as a dependent person, then it is the guardian that gets responsibility, but he's always a human. But if you try to apply criminal law, then in order to be able to punish or to reform somebody for a crime, he needs to be considered as a moral agent. And robots nowadays <coughs> certainly cannot be considered as moral agents. So, only when we reach a state where robots might be able to pass some kind of a moral Turing test in which we will ask them moral dilemmas and we will get their answers and see if they're indistinguishable from humans or not, will we be able to potentially consider them as moral agents. Thus, although right now there is no clear superiority for humans or machines, I think that in the future, uh, machines will be more capable for getting the license to kill. But does this mean that humans will be left out of the loop? How can I start it again? But does this mean that humans will be left out of the loop? No, not at all. Humans will always be there to design machines, devise their ethical systems, tune the parameters of the systems, and then authorize, deploy, and supervise machines. And in many cases, we will always have some kind of mixed autonomy with both of them in control. Thus, having seen the first question, let us move to the second. How can we try to make sure that we can safeguard beauty and get closer to a utopia and not a dystopia in the future? Well, I don't know the answer. And I don't even have a clear sketch of a possible answer. And that's exactly why I'm here talking to you. I do know, however, that any such answer should definitely pass from at least three things. Delicate social engineering, opinion making, and tough politics. And there is an intricate web of actors and interests behind the situation. You have the governments of the world. You have the military industry, extremely powerful, and the IT industry. You have academia with whatever role it might be playing today. You have the mass media and the opinion makers, the international organizations, and in the middle of it all, 
you have the citizens of the world that have the right to determine their own future. Within this situation, what we really need to do is to be able to find a way to do a delicate realignment of the interests, the roles, and the relations of all of these entities in order to start moving in the right direction. And there's many open questions in roboethics for which we neither have enough theory nor experience. I mean, will robo wars be shorter and cleaner than traditional wars? Will robots ever be considered as moral agents? How about cultural differences in the perception of robots? I mean, Japan is a very different place for robots when it comes you know, to the differences with Europe. One other important question. Is waging ethical warfare a disadvantage to those that are waging it? And even more so, beyond killer robots, how about the ethics of companion robots, medical robots, and all the social robots that we talked about? I mean, would you let your child be taught by a robot? Would you let your baby be taken care of by a robonani? And there's many questions around that. Therefore, we have gone a long way today, and I have gone a long way from the red spot, I guess. <laughs> we started by talking about the beauty of nature and arrived at the beauty of relations, and we talked about human and human-machine relations. We talked about ethics, and finally, robo-ethics, and asked what is required in order to give to the machine the license to kill. Humanity has gone a long way too. We were able to fight disease. We were able to conquer the skies and reach space. We were able to, up to a point, at least extend our lifetime and increase our population. However, as once General Omar Bradley said, we are still in many respects ethical infants. I personally come from a tradition that deeply values radical innovation. And thus, I wouldn't want to see humanity getting back into a recession with no progress due to the fear of introduction of new technologies. When there is so much that we can do in order to improve the human condition and break through our limitations through technology. But at the same time, I come from a tradition that values beauty very much. And not only the superficial kind of beauty of form, but the deeper beauty of relation. And thus, I wouldn't want to see humanity passed through a horrific disturbance as a transitional phase due to the unthoughtful introduction of all of these new technologies. Thus, we really need to think deeply and devise social processes in order to be able to make sure that we can embed ethics in the introduction of our exponentially growing technologies. And this ethics has to be vitalizing and humanizing and not castrating and inhibiting. This ethics has to be safeguarding harmony and not hindering progress. Therefore, imagine a world that robots are part of your everyday life. And not only as helpers, but also as companions and friends. A world where the crippled get fit and walk, where the blind get eyes to see, where beautiful memories are retained forever. A world where in the smart green cities of the future, we can all, our citizens can make their dreams come true through participatory processes, and we can safeguard the biosphere of our beautiful Mother Earth. And in order for us to be able this dreamlike world, make this dreamlike world a reality and not a nightmare, this should also be a world where humanity will have remembered what it has often forgotten, that beauty lies not in the form alone, but in the relation. And that if one looks carefully and far away towards that infinitesimal point in the horizon, it is always true that the rays of the persistently and essentially beautiful converge with the rays of the good. Thank you. <laughs>